Don't you dare buy another hair, skin, and nail supplement without watching this video to the end. We are gonna be talking about why hair, skin, and nail supplements can be pretty problematic. Well, hey guys, welcome back to the video. On this channel, I have a ton of videos reviewing various and sundry hair, skin, and nail supplements. It is no secret, there is a lot of money to be made in the hair, skin, and nail supplement game. The global beauty supplement industry as a whole is growing and growing. In 2016, it was worth about $3.6 billion. By 2024, it's slated to be worth around $6.8 billion. That is a lot of money. People keep buying these supplements over and over again. New supplement brands launch every five minutes. But the real question is, why the heck do people keep buying these anyway? When in reality, there is very, very limited research, if any, to suggest that they actually work. A lot of people anecdotally report that they feel as though their hair looks better when they take certain supplements, their nails are smoother, shinier, and their skin is glowier, so they're happy to continue taking them because after all, it's not like I'm taking a medication, right? Just because it's not called a medication doesn't mean that it doesn't come along with the same, if not many more, issues that medications can come with. What the heck constitutes a hair, skin, and nail supplement anyway? The legal definition for a dietary supplement is as follows. That of an ingestible product containing a dietary ingredient, but one that is not marketed as a conventional food or sole item of a meal or diet. Supplement is a pretty broad category. To say hair, skin, and nail supplement, it could include at least 85,000 different various and sundry ingredients. Supplements are not regulated as drugs. They're regulated as foods. And I know what a lot of you are thinking. Great, I don't like medications. I don't like drugs. That's what I'm trying to avoid. I hate the FDA. I don't want that. I just want something all natural. Because supplements are not regulated as drugs, there's no need for the manufacturer manufacturer to demonstrate safety or efficacy of their product prior to selling it to you, whereas a drug has to demonstrate these things. With supplements, there are no restrictions on the doses of a given vitamin or mineral that are used in the final formulation. Even for nutrients that have tolerable upper intake levels, a tolerable upper intake level of a given nutrient is basically the maximum dosage that is thought to be safe and not have any adverse effects for the general population. But a supplement is free to exceed these tolerable upper intake levels and could potentially be including doses so high of given vitamins and minerals that they do start posing risk. But because they're not regulated as drugs, they are free to do that. In contrast to drugs, supplement manufacturers can mix and match different ingredients and they don't actually have to do any uh, legwork to show that it's actually safe to combine those different ingredients and it's not going to either inactivate the ingredient or it's not going to lead to increased risk for various harm. You see, with drugs, with medications, we know that certain drug combinations can lead to adverse events. Either drug alone is perfectly safe when dosed appropriately, but when taken together, they can have negative effects on the person's health. For example, some drugs slow down the metabolism of other drugs, making those other drugs now toxic at a otherwise safe dose. Or some combinations may make it so that other things in the formula are not absorbed properly. Supplement manufacturers also don't have to document if there are any interactions with their supplement and medications. While supplement manufacturers are expected by the FDA to comply with what's called good manufacturing practices, in reality, they don't actually have to prove that they are doing that. But what constitutes a hair, skin, and nail supplement anyway. If you go out into the vitamin stores, Target, etc., you're gonna find so much heterogeneity out there in terms of what's included in a given hair, skin, and nail supplement. A lot of them, a lot of them have very high amounts of biotin in them. Many of them may have collagen peptides. Some of them have hyaluronic acid. Some of them have ceramide, various and sundry antioxidants in combination. Let's go over six problematic issues with hair, skin, and nail supplements that you should factor in before deciding that you are willing to give any hair, skin, and nail supplement a go. Number one is drug-drug interactions, meaning the supplement might interfere with any medications or other supplements that you might be taking and that potentially could put you in harm's way. Supplements can interact with medications. They can interact with other supplement ingredients. Supplements can interact with lab tests. So when you go to the doctor and the doctor draws blood, they send that blood to a lab to test it for things. 
Some supplements can mess up the ability of the lab to properly and correctly test the blood for certain things, leading to potentially misdiagnoses. We have come to learn that high amounts of biotin, which are commonly found in many hair, skin, and nail supplements, actually interfere with the accuracy of lab tests that your doctor might order to check your thyroid hormone or to check to see if you are having a heart attack. Anytime you are prescribed a medication, you wanna make sure you you have disclosed all supplements you are taking. Say you end up in urgent care with a sore throat, the doctor's gonna write a prescription for an antibiotic. Supplements you are taking could potentially interfere with that antibiotic. A study published in 2000 in the Lancet, a highly respected medical journal, they identified more than 1,400 unique interactions involving over 200 supplements. So the potential for interactions with medications and supplements is quite great. Problem number two with hair, skin, and nail supplements is teratogenicity. What the heck is that? Teratogenicity refers to substances that cause fetal abnormalities when ingested during pregnancy. In contrast to drugs, supplements are not required to categorize their pregnancy safety. And there's not going to be research out there on the safety of any given supplement in pregnancy or breastfeeding as a side note. If you pick up a supplement, the majority of them do say something to the effect of, if you are pregnant or nursing, consult with a doctor before consuming. But the majority of them don't warn against known harms of consuming the supplement during pregnancy. For example, who here has heard of the drug finasteride? I have a whole video on it. Finasteride is a medication given to men for pattern hair loss. It belongs to a class of medications known as 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. But if you gave finasteride to a pregnant woman, it can cause fetal abnormalities, uh, namely, abnormal genitalia in uh, male babies. We'll dance on into the vitamin shop then and pick you up a hair, skin, and nail supplement that has saw palmetto in it. Guess what saw palmetto does? It is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. So it carries the same risk of fetal abnormalities that finasteride does. Furthermore, we don't really know the harms to the developing fetus that can come with taking very high doses of given vitamins or nutrients. Like I said, certain vitamins and nutrients that have established upper limits of daily consumption that you know for the general public are considered safe. But that's not to say that we know anything about what consuming mega doses of those could be in terms of harm to fetal development. A lot of hair, skin, and nail supplements might have high levels of zinc. There is an association with high zinc in the cord blood and neurodevelopmental problems. Now, of course, association does not prove causation, but that is merely to illustrate that there is always the potential that taking high amounts of things could be harmful. The other vitamin that is often included at high levels that could be potentially dangerous for pregnant women is vitamin A. You will often find high levels of vitamin A in hair, skin, and nail supplements. I mean, we have a lot of medications that are related to vitamin A, and they are not safe to take during pregnancy, like Accutane. A study looking at women who took over 10,000 international units of vitamin A a day, one in 57 had a fetal abnormality. And this is most actually common in the first seven weeks of gestation, which unfortunately is a time when a lot of women don't even realize they are pregnant. Problem number three is the risk for drowsiness. A lot of hair, skin, and nail supplements will piggyback as a nighttime supplement and will add melatonin. Now, melatonin is a hormone. It's taken to help decrease wakefulness to allow people to go to sleep. It, you know, it can be helpful for people who work swing shifts, but taking very high amounts of it actually can be problematic to your sleep uh, and cause drowsiness. So, so you have to read labels carefully. There are definitely hair, skin, and nail supplements out there that, that pair high amounts of melatonin with various and sundry other ingredients alleging benefit for hair, skin, and nails, and they're intended to be taken at nighttime. I also have concerns with these high amounts of melatonin in in these types of supplements in terms of drowsiness for older adults. Older adults, they're a group who are at risk for falls. Problem number four with hair, skin, and nail supplements is the potential to overdose, toxicity. People, people want to shy away from medications. They view them as, you know, potentially toxic, but toxicity most certainly can occur with dietary supplements. Some supplements can put you at risk for something called milk alkali syndrome, which is basically a, a situation where you have 
very dangerously high calcium, you have kidney problems, the um, pH in your body is not is not where it needs to be. It's called a metabolic alkalosis. Excessive consumption of selenium can be actually quite toxic. Taking too much of it uh, can lead to brittle nails and hair breakage. It also can cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. High amounts of selenium is associated with an increased risk of diabetes and all-cause mortality. Higher is not better. We talk about this a lot when we talk about skincare products, things that we put on our skin, but the same applies for things that we take into our body. You definitely can have too much of a good thing where it starts to not only have diminishing returns, but can be toxic. High amounts of certain antioxidants definitely have been actually associated with an increased risk of cancer, despite how you know beneficial antioxidants are in our body for combating against stressors that put us at risk for cancers. Taking too much in can actually skew things in the wrong direction. A randomized controlled trial actually of a, of a dietary supplement that included vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, selenium, and zinc. Women taking this, uh, after seven and a half years, the incidence of skin cancer was actually higher in the women taking the supplement as opposed to controls. Problem number five is allergenicity. People can be allergic to certain compounds in supplements. Uh, you know, and, and presumably you know that going in, but it's, it's just another potential issue to factor in uh, is, is that specifically as it relates to the collagen supplements, because the collagen supplements are often derived from either fish, pork, or beef. And so if you have existing allergies to those, you really, really, really need to be careful. There actually have been reports of anaphylaxis, which is a life-threatening allergic reaction to collagen peptides. Problem number six is quality. There's a really, really low barrier of entry into the supplement market. Uh, like I said, no one is policing these supplement manufacturers at length to make sure they're adhering to good manufacturing practices. They don't have to demonstrate safety or efficacy. They really don't have to do much. I mean, shoot, there are a lot of influencers who launch their own supplement brand. Uh, okay, like with no background in pharmacology whatsoever. And that's not to say that all who do have supplement brands are just in it for the cash, although it is a lucrative business. Uh, you know, some of them may be partnering with people who are highly, highly knowledgeable and adhering to good practices. So I'm not trying to paint everyone in a bad light, but it's just something to be mindful of. There is a very low barrier to entry into having a supplement. Whereas a drug, in order to get a drug to market, we're talking a ton of safety data that has to be shown, efficacy data, I mean, you name it. That's why you know people, people don't like medications because they come with a pamphlet that is terrifying to read. But don't assume because there's no pamphlet with a supplement that the potential harms are not there. It's just, they don't have to give you any pamphlet. The FDA can only be inspecting a small fraction of all of the supplement manufacturers out there. I mean, the FDA is very limited in their resources to be doing this. In 2019, they investigated 560 factories. They issued letters of non-compliance to over 50% of these. Some of these who were issued warnings were hair, skin, and nail supplements. So there is a good chance that the hair, skin, and nail supplement you may be interested in is not the best quality. Um, there, as far as quality issues, there can be dosing inconsistencies. Recently, I did a whole video shedding light on dosing inconsistencies with the melatonin gummies. Uh, melatonin in, in gummies being found at a very, very high amount. If you're going to go with a supplement, I highly suggest choosing one that has undergone third-party quality testing. Uh, some of these parties include Office of Dietary Supplements, uh, USP, United States Pharmacopeia, NSF, uh, or consumer labs. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to paint the whole industry as just problematic, tainted, whatever. There are really good brands out there of supplements that do right by their ingredients. They have them third-party tested. And the third-party testing basically ensures that what's on the label is what you're actually getting. A recent study looking at hair, skin, and nail supplements, only about 3.4% of them actually undergo third-party testing. So always look out for that on there. Claims get nebulous. When we're talking about a supplement, they can't make claims like a medication can. They can't claim that it's gonna treat or correct or prevent or diagnose any given health problem. So for example, a hair, skin, and nail supplement cannot be like, this is going to treat alopecia. This is going to prevent pattern hair loss. They can't make claims like that. But they can make health claims, they can make structure function claims, and then they can also make claims around the nutrient content in, in their product. In the absence of biotin deficiency, there's no data to show that taking biotin is helpful for hair. 
care. High amounts of biotin can interfere with blood work, and a lot of people actually report that they get these acne-like breakouts with, with biotin. It can cause digestive upset. Zinc can interfere with the uh, absorption of copper. You can become copper deficient from taking too much zinc. So you need to be careful and, and conscientious of these potential risks. Always disclose with your healthcare provider that you're taking, and you've got to understand that there's a huge difference between using a supplement to treat a deficiency or insufficiency. So, you know, biotin deficiency is super, super rare, but in the cases that it does occur, yeah, it's, it, it, the treatment's gonna be biotin. But uh, for people who don't have biotin deficiency, uh, you know, the, to say that it's beneficial to take, there's just not the data there. There's a huge difference. Many people will say, I prefer to try a supplement before a medication because it's you know, a lot more natural. But is it? You know, these supplements, they are synthetic ingredients in most cases, and not to say that there's anything harmful with that, but as a friendly reminder, many medications are also natural substances. Pacific yew tree, who, who wants to take that? That sounds all natural. Yeah, that's Taxol, Paclitaxol, a chemotherapeutic, no thank you. And if I am gonna take that, it's gonna be because I have a cancer, and I, the only person I want giving it to me is an oncologist who knows how to dose it properly, because that bad boy can have a lot of adverse effects. But you know, it's derived from a tree, all natural. Foxglove, a plant, that's what we get digital from. I'm not taking that because <laughs> I don't have a heart problem. If I took that, it'd be dangerous for my health. But other people need it, benefit from it. With supplements, we, there's all this gray territory. We don't know who would actually benefit from it, who's going to be harmed by it. A lot of people don't trust medications because of, you know, quote unquote, big pharma. They don't, you know, want to give money to the pharmaceutical industry. And I totally understand that. I mean, we're bombarded le left and right with advertisements for various and sundry drugs. I mean, it, it definitely, like, I totally understand where people are coming from. But on the flip side, like, so why are you willing to give your money to, to, to big supplement? Because they're a huge, huge industry as well. Something to think about. All right, guys, so those are the problems that you can run into with hair, skin, and nail supplements. By and large, I don't believe that hair, skin, and nail supplements are necessarily beneficial. You know, I don't push people to, to go after them. I think, uh, you know, it's just such a, such a gray area. Uh, with very little research and regulation behind it. Do I think all supplements, though, are bad? Heck no. I mean, if you know me, you know I actually take several supplements myself. I'm definitely not the most conservative when it comes to supplements, you know, and I do see a role for them. Uh, especially in certain situations and for certain individuals. But I'm making this video because I want you guys to be aware of the limitations and the problems with supplements, and maybe that can help you make more of an informed decision moving forward as to whether or not you're gonna buy supplements, try them out, your willingness, and hopefully this makes you more keenly aware of and willing to talk to your doctor about supplements, which I think you know goes a long way. Uh, talking to your doctor about the supplements that you're taking make sure they're aware. That way, you know, you don't run into the risk of using a supplement with a medication that could have a deadly consequence for you. All right, guys, let me know in the comments, have you ever tried a hair, skin, and nail supplement? Which one? Did you think it worked? Do you still take it? If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you check out my video reviewing Biosil and comparing it to Biotin. So check that one out next. It'll be on the end slate. But if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye!